Actually, I'd like to start uh, with also two, let's say, thank you notes, uh, not only to you, but also uh, it's really fantastic to be here in a situation where there's actually Jane and Hubert in the same room. Um, Jane, uh, for the reason that I've been very inspired by your writings and also this program that I'm currently uh, running at the Städelschule in Frankfurt, which is called Architecture and Critical Spatial Practice, of course, very much based on a lot of your kind of previous ideas. Uh, but also, I think with Hubert, it's really uh, brilliant that he's here, and I'm sure we can have an interesting exchange later. Uh, because of your entrepreneurial approach within architecture, and especially something that I will also touch on in the talk, which relates to something that I call without mandate. So in other words, how does one practice without actually being asked to do something? Um, just maybe one last uh, comment before I start, because I actually wanted to say something in this earlier conversation about this uh, question between the virtual and the physical, um, which I think it's kind of interesting, of course, in 2011 we saw a lot of, um, let's say, physicalization happening place in a time which is quite virtual. So if we think about the Arab Spring and we think of situations like Tahrir Square or, um, of course, the Occupy movement, I think even if you know some of us may have some some issues with some of the stuff that was being put on the plate or on the table, at the same time I think these movements or these phenomena were very interesting because they precisely understood that even in times of the virtual environment becoming stronger and stronger, there is still a real necessity for certain processes to become physical, especially in urban environments. Okay, so <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today is this uh, role model, let's say, that I'm interested in, which I call crossbench uh, praxis or the crossbench uh, practice practitioner. And this is really based on uh, kind of longer term research that I've been uh, involved in on the issue of participation. But uh, participation not from the point of view of a kind of all inclusive model, i.e., let's get everyone around the table and uh, produce some kind of all inclusive. A very democratic model, but precisely the kind of entrepreneurial approach that I was just mentioning, so without mandate. So what happens when you turn this notion of uh, participation around? So this was done through a series of uh, publications in terms of, let's say, more theoretical research. Uh, the first one was called Did Someone Say Participate, which really um, uh, set up some of the kind of hypotheses or questions that are uh, was investigating and looking at at the time together with my co-editor Shumon Bazar. Second one, uh, the yellow one, is called The Violence of Participation. Uh, the Nightmare of Participation, which is pretty much the more kind of theoretical background of the whole issue. And then a fourth one, which came out recently, which is a reflection by other people on that issue, uh, which is called Waking Up from the Nightmare of Participation. So, um, when I started this research project, it was really to find out what this issue of participation is really about and whether actually when we talk about participation, especially since the tail end of the 90s, there was a lot of also, let's say, romanticization about the term, especially in the art world from my point of view. The question was really, okay, so what does this really mean? Or maybe actually we're talking about something completely different. And also in terms of political, um, kind of turmoils, let's say, at the tail end of the 90s, but especially in the early zero zeros. Uh, there was also a couple of interesting things happening, for example, in the, new, in the UK and the New Labour, but also in Holland, for example, with this whole notion of the Polder model, which I found uh, fairly problematic in terms of politicians actually quite often using participation as a term or as some form of romanticized practice in order to legitimize their um, kind of political aims. Um, but as I said, what I'm really interested in is actually to kind of invert this process, so to no longer talk about participation as a process where we're kind of getting everyone around the table to discuss issues together and then through some sort of consensual agreement come uh, uh, well, to an agreement and then move on from there. But really uh, for there to be a kind of new role, let's say, that really takes a starting point, this idea of the individual taking responsibility and the individual actually making a conscious decision to participate in an environment where one was previously not uh, involved or invited to act. 
which is really to do with this idea of acting without mandate. So that has a lot to do with self-initiation, uh, which of course also relates to the question of uh, consensual practices and whether the census may actually also be considered as a productive mode of conflict, and which leads us to three kind of central questions. One is that of responsibility. So in other words, how do we assume it? <coughs> Questions of auth authorship and the question of how collaboration can come into these practices. And when I talk of collaboration, I mean collaboration versus cooperation. So it's not a kind of mode of, let's say, consensually working together, but one which also at its core has some kind of conflictual nature. And the question of agency and uh, often this kind of misunderstanding, I think, when uh, we talk about participation that, uh, especially in the context of architecture, that then one is often understood as a kind of good doer or the um, kind of social worker. Um, there's a very interesting term in German, which I mean, most of you guys will probably uh, be aware of, which is Einmischung, which actually translate, doesn't really translate into uh, English, but it's a kind of hybrid of these three things. So it's some form of proactive practice. It's about getting involved and practicing as a productive irritant. And one of the examples I tend to use, which I find super interesting in terms of a political biography, is that of uh, Joschka Fischer, who I guess most of you are aware of. Um, and the reason why I'm interested in him is not so much in terms of necessarily the politics that he represents, but uh, the kind of um, biography he went through. So from a kind of uh, activist background, let's say, without uh, higher education um, and kind of slowly moving through the uh, kind of formal institutions all the way up to kind of state um, representation. And I think what's particularly interesting from the point of view of uh, kind of uh, leftist critique is that at least to the extent that I'm aware of, he's pretty much the only player on that scale that I know who really took serious this idea of uh, the uninvited outsider, as I called it, or uh, Gramsci's long march through the institutions. However, he was actually always one who also from the left was very heavily criticized for his actions. So somehow this is for me a very interesting um, biography because somehow he's uh, in between the chairs. So here's a couple of images of what um, to, in, let's say, in different, to different degrees, you could call it some form of uh, participatory practice. And what really interests me is uh, from which position is one actually talking when one refers to these kind of practices. And especially the image on the left, which is this one, is one that interests me, which is an image from the House of Lords in the UK. And that's, of course, a very kind of conservative uh, political setting. And I'm only using this as an analogy, but what very much interests me about them, which is uh, these guys sitting in the middle, is um, not only their kind of um, political background, which is that of independent politicians, so that they don't belong, they neither belong to Tory nor Labour, so they're kind of independent. They've been voted in there for other reasons than party background, but also literally within the space, they're kind of positioning, so they're kind of between the chairs, um, they're the cross benches. And that particularly interests me because uh, their decision making doesn't have to go through a kind of presupposed form of inter-party consensus, but they, in a kind of very, um, let's say, almost nostalgic way, can make their decision based on their kind of ethical beliefs, which I'm slightly overdoing it, that's also of course not quite true, but uh, I'm just using it as an analogy. Which is something that um, I've then tried to develop in this uh, book, The Nightmare of Participation, um, uh, which is part of my PhD actually, which will then really try to come to terms with this issue of uh, cross branch practices. So it all started with this uh, publication called Did Someone Say Participate, which is basically a um, anthology of uh, works where we invited uh, a series of practitioners to reflect on the work that they had been doing at that time. This was in 2006. I'm just going to show a couple of examples um, to illustrate what um, we were interested in in terms of the, at the time, issues of, let's say, critical production of space, not necessarily from the point of architects or architecture per se, but spatial production. So this is an image 
of a project by a group called Women on Waves, which was founded by Rebecca Gompertz. And it's a basically floating abortion clinic, which, uh, was, which is this container on the vessel in the front, which was sent into territorial waters of those countries where abortion is illegal. And the idea was that they would basically pick up women from the shore and then leave into um, or exit territorial waters into international waters where the jurisdiction of those countries doesn't apply and to carry out the abortion in those um, waters. There was actually never an abortion carried out on the vessel, but um, of course the main idea about this project was uh, to start a kind of media rhetoric which worked fantastically well and the image that you see here is actually an image that was taken off the coast of Australia and these two vessels you can see in the background are navy vessels that are trying to stop it from entering territorial waters. This is an image um, by a colleague of ours who at the time worked as a field worker for the for a United Nations program in northern Iraq. These guys are called D-miners and you have to imagine there's many of them who are slowly ridding the fields of mines and what particularly interested us in this approach is that um, one could of course say that it's maybe not such a good example of spatial practice but what's actually really interesting is that they're not adding anything, in fact they're doing the opposite, they're removing something but actually by, through that process of removing they're preparing the ground for kind of future use. It's a project that probably most of you know by Israeli architect and theorist Eyal Weizmann who did a project on um, the West Bank. Uh, this is actually one of the earlier works um, which we found particularly interesting for the book because it uses a very standard tool of architecture which is the tool of drawing in order to visually notate or kind of visually illustrate um, power relationships, political power relationships. And this is uh, one of the pages of a series of photographs by um, artist Armin Linke who uh, in this series specifically looked at the spatial politics around the uh, Davos Economic Forum and um, the kind of spatial repercussions that this has. Um, I'm going to show you a series of examples of, of projects that all deal with the issue of staging discourse, which is something that really interests me in my practice. Um, one of them was a project that happened at the Lyon Biennial in 2007, which was a project that happened just after two of the European referenda for the European Constitution had failed. And um, I was invited to do some kind of project about the, the first decade of the 21st century, and uh, it was supposed to somehow reflect the most, or oh, this was the idea of the curators, that it would somehow reflect the most interesting aspects of that uh, generation of the, the first uh, century, uh, the first uh, decade of the 21st century. But somehow I th the idea was that one wouldn't come up with a kind of best of list of architects to represent, but to really think about a theme that was uh, very relevant at this moment in time, which was the European Constitution. And the hypothesis somehow for the project was that it's actually quite difficult to make a decision about space that you cannot really imagine in terms of what are the kind of um, geographical limits, what are the geopolitical limits. And so we asked 100 uh, individuals and groups, 50 of them were all the uh, participating artists of the Biennial and another 50 uh, around the globe, to send us their spatial perceptions of Europe, which is these drawings that you can see on the back. And we designed this kind of quirky yellow table, which um, really starts from this notion of the round table, which of course is a, not only a symbol, but also a kind of working platform of generating consensus and uh, turning it actually into the, into the opposite, which is a, a series of individualized booths dissected by these vertical elements that uh, represent also, I guess, this kind of notion of the ballot booth, but where there was really this idea that the audience of the biennial would then start to corrupt these existing perceptions. So um, the, the kind of shared space in the middle uh, was full of photocopies of all the perceptions that were drawn prior to the biennial and those were then being used by the audience to superimpose their own 
beyond this. So basically, all the, the drawings that were produced prior to the Bayamir were bastardized by the audience, and then kind of the audience added those layers um, of their own drawings. There was also a publication about this, as I mentioned, uh, which was called The Violence of Participation, which is also the title of the um, show. And in, within that, there was really this idea to uh, produce kind of a series of uh, conflictual talks about Europe and European uh, representation, but through very uh, distinct readings, let's say. So this is, uh, this is, for example, one of the couples, so to speak, that was represented in the book. So on the right, Chantal Mouffe, who's a political theorist and um, the, let's say, idea giver of the concept of agonism, uh, who um, I interviewed for the book, as all these 10 pieces were basically conversations. And the other one on the left is Oscar Kilaba, who was my uh, mountain guide on Kilimanjaro. And of course, his uh, view of Europe, let's say, is um, generated only through you know, people essentially like me who would pay a lot of money to go on his home mountain, but he has never left Tanzania. So he has this very kind of weird, um, let's say, relationship or contact to Europe. And so the idea was that one would uh, set up these um, sets of conversations that then also speculate on different sets of uh, spatial perceptions of Europe. Um, out of this project uh, came another project uh, which was actually a commissioned project um, by the uh, government of Slovenia during the presidency of the EU Council in 2008. And so during these six months, the, these countries always run cultural program and uh, together with uh, Sergeant Jovanovic Weiss and Catherine Karl from School of Missing Studies in New York, I curated the program uh, for these six months in New York. And we started basically with a very uh, silly hypothesis, which was to say that if we're gonna do all these um, projects and conversations on the east coast of the US, because this was where the, it would take place because of the United Nations headquarter, um, for a moment we're gonna pretend that Europe actually also has an east coast. So the red line that you can see on the right is this kind of imaginary east coast. And we were speculating within this project what would happen if one would imagine a kind of um, continental drift, so to speak. So if actually Europe all of a sudden would turn into an island, would shift uh, westwards, and what would be this kind of new east coast of Europe, but especially on the other shore. So basically from the east looking west towards Europe. And what would happen in terms of speculation if, for example, certain countries would join the European Union. So one of the examples we always used was Turkey, because at the time this was a big discussion whether Turkey would join the Union, which of course for us was super interesting because if they would have done so, then Europe or the European Union would have an immediate physical and geopolitical border with Iran, which of course then also produces lots of interesting speculations and discussions. There were also a couple of, uh, let's say, physical components to this project, like this installation, which was on a rooftop on Karl Marx Allee in Berlin. Um, but the main part of uh, the, this project was really a series of conversations where we brought <coughs> 10 people from the east coast of Europe, with, together with 10 people from the east coast of the US, and were speculating on those questions of Europe. So this was an, this image was taken at the New School, and there were also a couple of uh, events at the New York Public Library, which um, also culminated in a book, which was really kind of, I mean, strangely produced in a very uh, kind of ad hoc way, because we only had two months to do this. So we, we uh, curated it almost like, like you would curate a magazine, for example. So it's, um, there's a couple of kind of key texts, but the main um, uh, body of the book are interviews and conversations. Again, uh, 10 from the east coast of the US and 10 from the east coast of the EU. And the only reason actually why I'm showing this book is because there was also kind of issue that we were interested in terms of distribution. Because, um, as most of you are probably aware of, um, when these kind of projects happen in the, in the art world, you usually for publications you get a kind of okay budget, but it's not particularly great, but everyone wants you to do a uh, kind of precious physical object. 
But so we decided to do the reverse, so not to go with a, a very nicely produced book, which costs a lot of money, but to really try to find the cheapest um, possible uh, printer, which we then did a little research project about because we thought it's probably either in the Far East or China. Um, but actually it was in Denmark, and this kind of, uh, this book, which was the result, is actually what looks like kind of Pulp Fiction novel, and you can produce a 330 page book for 41 euro cents per copy, which meant that instead of producing 1500, we could produce 8000, uh, which meant also that we decided only 2000 of those would go into mainstream distribution through a publisher, and the rest uh, would be given away for free, and this was, for example, at the launch at the uh, Swiss Institute in New York, where we just put a thousand copies. And of course, the idea was that people would then just take as many as they want and uh, kind of process a viral distribution start. So it's a bit like a magazine if it's on your, I don't know, coffee table or on your couch and you go to a friend's house for dinner and you just ask whether you can take the magazine and therefore kind of other layer of distribution starts. Um, there's a series of projects that I've been involved in in the last couple of years, uh, some by myself, some with a kind of former office that I've had with two partners called an office. And those projects were mostly about um, the issue or the notion of enabling conflict. So the, really this idea that within the staging of discourse, within the staging of events, how can you uh, produce different settings that foster a different kind of debate? And actually most, most of these projects weren't commissions, but again they were based on this notion of without mandate, so how, do you, how can you actually start talking to institutions and start to um, generate projects yourself. One of the, uh, like, let's say, underlying um, policies in the office was and is that we're not really doing competitions. So this is our way of uh, producing projects. In a way. So this is a project that we did um, with a Dutch organization called SCORE and it was for a conference and the idea was that uh, you create a setting which is no longer monodirectional like the one we have now where you're all looking this way and where we're all presenting from here and then we're sitting at the table but where would one would basically create four different conditions in four different directions and the audience constantly had to shift uh, according to the programming of the event and therefore also through that uh, kind of constant shift, produce not only different situations in terms of how one talks to the audience and how the audience talks to the speakers, but also in terms of how the audience would talk to one another, because of course you constantly have to change your position and therefore you also in very informal ways start new conversations. This is a project we did for Manifesta, um, which in many ways is um, in terms of the kind of architectural setting, it's based on the um, House of Commons in London and this idea of kind of immediate juxtaposition of, I mean, immediate spatial juxtaposition of different uh, um, belief systems, let's say, which was then also later on, this was during a kind of uh, prior to the Biennial where there was a film being produced about this particular discussion, which was then again staged at the biennial and also being used as a general meeting space. Um, this is a project we did uh, for Performer Biennial in New York, which is called Performer Hub. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Performer, it's a decentralized biennial, um, basically spread over uh, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens. And prior to the 2009 edition of the biennial, they didn't have a central space. So there wasn't really a home, so to speak. And um, this was a kind of first attempt to bring certain events all together in, in one space, which was this thing called the Hub. And this was only really interesting for us because the, the budget for this space was $12,000, uh, which is called, of course nothing, and it was a 250 square meter space. So the decision was then to literally just simply use one material and produce what we call this kind of bastardized space where we try to flatten all programs that they wanted in one space which then continuously started to create these conflicts because 
you know, some people would be sitting in one uh, corner having a presentation while on the left, for example, National Public Radio would constantly be doing interviews and other people would be buying books or making a coffee or just sitting and chatting. Uh, this was for the latest edition of the Biennial where we explored the notion of what happens if you try to turn a corridor into a kind of uh, content machine. And this was another one of these kind of settings that we explored for the Guangzhou Biennial last year which uh, was called on-site, which was again a kind of hub where all the social activities during the Bayangian took place. Um, I'm just going to show this uh, super small project, which is a project, actually the only project we've ever done in Berlin, where we live and work, um, which is a small discursive space in Kreuzberg called Archive Cabinet. Um, and the only thing that really I want to show is actually this weird space on the bottom right, which the image is not very representational because at this time it's being used as a display for books, but it's basically the core social space within that setting. And as you can see, it's ridiculously small. We call it the sauna, and the idea was basically to fill up the entire space with a kind of wraparound bleacher, so with this kind of um, amphitheater setting, but which would be so big that the last remaining space, so to speak, on the floor would be so small that you couldn't actually use it. So everything that happens in that space, whether it's lectures, conferences, um, presentations, everyone has to sit on the bleacher, and usually that these events are quite packed, so if there's 30 or 40 people, they're sitting incredibly close to one another, and there's also a really uncomfortable kind of feeling. So the idea was really through that, um, let's say, density, produce different kind of conversation and through this kind of, um, kind of uncomfortable feeling of being socially together also to produce a kind of immediateness in terms of conversation. Um, another project I was involved in together with uh, Nicolas Hirsch and uh, Philip Misiewicz was a project for the European Kunsthal in Cologne, uh, which was a kind of, let's say, uh, research and practice project which happened between 2004 and 2006, uh, which was based on uh, a particular project which was a very interesting Kunsthal, which also in terms of the history of the city of Cologne was a super important building, which was then uh, destroyed by the city authorities who were promising that they were going to build another building, which didn't actually happen, and the city was left with this kind of scar in the urban tissue, which then led to a um, foundation of a new institution called the European Kunsthalle and which then for two and a half years speculated on kind of new or maybe not new physicalization or spatialization of the institution and whether that spatialization would even be necessary today. So there were two components to this and I'm really going to be brief about this because I could also talk about this for a long time but I'm just going to show these two things which are the two components um, that we programmed for two consecutive years. One was a 30-day symposium, which, where basically every day two events would take place in different, um, what we call post-public conditions in the city. So those would be uh, kind of spaces such as um, like hotel lobbies, public car parks, call centers, brothels, mosques, any sort of space which is privately owned but publicly accessible, and the same concept we followed for, for a show which took place the year after, which is called Models for Tomorrow, which was a spec speculation on the possibility of a Kunsthalle without having a space, which were 22 site-specific installations in a one-mile radius around um, the office. And there's also a publication that um, summarizes this process called Institution Building. And probably, I mean, I hope the most relevant uh, project in this context of this uh, particular conference is um, a project that I've been involved in since um, 2007, which is a small institution I started in the Middle East called the Winter School Middle East, um, which I'm also, I have to unfortunately be really brief about this, but um, it, it was basically a kind of, gut reaction to, because at this time I spent a lot of time in the Middle East and there were, this was really at a time in 2006 when basically all Ivy League universities decided that they're going to uh, have satellite campuses 
in the Gulf. And they had a very kind of strange policy around this because basically they would just um, copy the curriculum and they would also send the same professors that would be teaching at the home universities. And there wasn't really any engagement with the local condition. And so as a result, I, with a couple of um, people in the area, I started this small institution called the Wind School Middle East, which in the beginning was um, also a collaboration with some other local institutions. But um, then at some point in, in 2009, I started it as a non-profit both in Germany and Kuwait, where we moved, so it started in Dubai and then uh, in 2010 we moved to Kuwait. And the idea is that there's annual themes, so we started for example in uh, 2008 with the theme of labor camps, this was very specific to Dubai, so for one year we investigated and researched this issue of labor camps. The second year was about institution building, so how to set up small, informal civic institutions within the region, which at that time was pretty much unknown. And the idea is always that this is not some kind of colonial model where we're coming in from the outside and telling them how to do it, but uh, the only thing that I did together with actually two locals was to set up a kind of fertile ground for things to happen. and. I'm pretty removed. I mean, basically, I, I sparked it, and then there's the series of people, also the co-director, um, she's a, a woman from Kuwait. And the idea is that one always brings together teachers and um, practitioners from the outside with practitioners from the Middle East, who then together teach studios. And one of the ideas is also that they would never meet before, so that also through that uh, meeting there's kind of fertile uh, production of knowledge. Um, the last year we were looking at an issue uh, specifically in Kuwait, which is called Diwaniya. It's a very interesting spatial topology. Um, of, it's, a, it's a very political uh, topology that exists 4,000 times in the uh, city of Kuwait, which are these spaces which are basically annexes to uh, private houses. And they're being used for informal um, this, uh, informal uh, conversations which are happening regularly once a week but what's very interesting is that they as a space appear in very different uh, informal and formal de uh, degrees so this of course is a very formal one by a very affluent family but they also exist like this which is in a refugee camp on the outskirts of Kuwait city but they're all having the same function and they're all equally um, being recognized. So this can of course go to a very informal setting like this even. But what's interesting is that on a regular basis these very informal structures are actually being visited by politicians. And even in the um, House of Parliament, and I really have to, of course I'm being very brief about this, but um, there's even in there the spatial setting for decision making is like this. So it's actually kind of strange topology that somehow is being um, reflected throughout the whole of uh, the spectrum of uh, Kuwaiti social life. So this was something that was uh, the, the topic of the research project last year, um, which also culminated in a um, short documentary project I did together with Joseph Grima, um, which was also interesting because the lady you can see on the left, that's Sarah Alibaba, the um, co-director of the Winter School. And as you might have noticed from these images, like for example this one, uh, I mean this one also, but Diwaniya historically is an absolutely male-dominated typology. Um, and previously the only women that had ever uh, kind of forced their way into Diwaniya were actually three candidates that were running for parliamentary seats. And by forcing their way into Diwaniya, they actually became members of parliament. And so. For us it was very interesting to work also with Zara on, on this because uh, she was really uh, probably the first woman in Kuwait who really started questioning a lot of those um, issues through conversations with those people that were running those. And I'm going to stop here with this project which is uh, uh, not a project but rather a framework for projects to happen which is um, this new program I set up last year at the uh, Städelschule in Frankfurt, which is called Architecture and Critical Spatial Practice. And 
Um, the special thing, let's say, within the setting of the Städelschule about this program is that it's the first time there's actually a class that's joined both by people from the architecture class and people from the different art classes. So um, they are together running different uh, projects uh, under an umbrella theme. It's a um, two-year program for the architects as a postgraduate and the artists they can join however they like and for however long they like. Um, I'm just going to show these uh, two projects that were being done this year under the umbrella of Cultures of Assembly. One um, was a specific uh, research into uh, global parliamentary settings, um, which was really about the kind of most formal you could get when it comes to Cultures of Assembly and the kind of formal political notions of spatial production when it comes to political settings. And the other one, the um, probably harshest opposite, which was a study, uh, a kind of precise spatial study of the Occupy camp in Frankfurt, and also looking at its kind of legal, um, uh, let's say, condition. Because what's really interesting about it is that it's actually not registered as a demonstration, but it's registered as a Mahnwache, which means that you have to reapply every two weeks but there's no way that um, the uh, city government can actually interfere with it as long as the cause, so to speak, hasn't been dealt with in any way. So as long as they're not doing any kind of violent, uh, or not uh, demonstrating any violent behavior, they can actually not really be removed, or at least that's what they thought, and the absurdity of the whole thing is that because of that legal status of the man battle, at some point, because a manbacher means that there constantly needs to be some form of either mourning or some form of uh, activity. At some point in November, when the bad weather started, they actually got a phone call from uh, one of the city officials, and they were told that if they don't protest more, they have to leave the site, which of course has to do with this issue of the kind of legal status. Um, I'm sorry, that actually wasn't the last one, but this is really the last one. So uh, this is just one uh, project that we're most recently working on, and it's the biggest uh, project to date actually. It's a former uh, NATO military site, which is between Frankfurt and um, Bonn or Cologne, in the Westerwald region. And it was uh, previously used to store nuclear warheads by the Americans during the Cold War. And it's very, um, I mean, basically speaking, there's two sections of this camp. One is the German sector and one is the American sector. The American sector was used to store the nuclear warheads because the Germans weren't allowed to have them. And the Germans were basically storing rockets. So in a kind of case of uh, nuclear emergency, they would have been brought to Frankfurt, assembled and uh, shot. So uh, basically a couple of years ago, um, a guy from the region found out about the site after it had been abandoned uh, after the fall of the war and just turned it into a kind of informal um, um, art center with 16 bunkers and several other facilities which have been uh, more or less renovated but there has never really been a kind of, um, let's say, master plan to it. And so we're now working on a kind of two-stage project. One is the kind of master plan, or like re-master planning this site in terms of the activities that are going on. And then on this particular site, a uh, kind of building that will actually sit on top and which will connect one of the uh, bunkers underneath with the landscape. Thank you very much.